Um, let's kick off our afternoon for the free-to-play games sessions. As I said this morning, my name is David Nixon. I'm the CEO and founder of Gemini Hive, and I work almost exclusively on uh, yeah, free-to-play mobile and web games. Um, so this is a, a track that I'm typically very involved in at all of the different shows, and, and I'm pretty passionate about because I love live operations in particular. Um, I'd like to uh, introduce two men from Tyler Projects uh, here in Singapore, right? Yep. Um, and uh, they're going to talk to us today about building hardcore games for social game platforms. So why don't you come on up? This is Leonard Lin from Tyler Projects. And I'm going to let you introduce your colleague once it's uh, time to bring him up on stage. OK? So here's the microphone, and good luck. All right. Uh, thanks for the introduction, David. Um, we do exclusively web and mobile games as well at Tyler Projects. I don't know how many of you guys actually caught the previous talk by Social Clicks. Um, if you notice um, on the left, uh, that's our best monetizing game, mascot, character, blue hair as well. So um, yeah, if you want to boost your monetization, quick tip, um, sell blue hair. Right, so i um, just going to do a quick introduction. Um, locally, we are sort of known for being um, the first guys in Singapore to develop um, a Facebook game. That Facebook game has been on the Facebook platform for last five years and is still running. So that's Bell Stations. Over the years, I mean, we've seen a lot of things happen on Facebook. Um, we've actually tried to follow a number of trends, not so successfully. So we do have like a mafia game, a farm game. But today I'm just going to focus on our two more successful titles. So that is Bell Stations and Social Life, which is a title that we actually launched um, just mid-December last year. So, um, well, I mean, this event is Casual Connect, but we are talking about creating a hardcore game. So these are the two games that I wanted to focus on, Bell Stations and Social Life. And, you know, maybe you guys can just take a guess, guess which one of these is the casual game and which one is the hardcore game. No, no prizes for guessing this one. So, um, and just to share a bit of like um, statistics, Bell Stations, we have a lot of um, male users, primarily um, age um, 25 to 34. So, um, and Social Life is kind of like the direct opposite of that. It's like 80% female users. But I think you might notice something else. Um, Social Life tends to have like younger, a younger audience as well. Whereas uh, Bell Stations, uh, we do have um, like mainly working adults and um, university students as our primary audience. So um, Bell Stations, um, hardcore game, monetizes really well, despite the fact that Social Life right now has a much higher active user count. Um, Bell Stations actually um, has like 10 times higher ARPU compared to Social Life. Um, so the gameplay is, you know, like 180 degrees different between these two games. Uh, what are some of the things that we sort of um, identify the differences between like um, our hardcore titles and casual titles? So our hardcore gamers, like, okay, they, they, we are quite happy about this, even though it may sound a bit strange, but like, okay, they don't play other games on Facebook, like. They would just stick to Bell Stations. I don't want to try other games. Um, one of the reasons for that is they have already invested a lot of money into the game. So we actually have um, um, like VIP ranks. We sort of modeled this after like the Chinese games. They have VIP ranks based on how much you have spent in the game. Uh, we actually have this VIP rank called um, Unobtainium. So it's for people who have spent like. Um, 10k and above, and we do have quite a number of those users. So these users, they, they actually like um, will make time when we run uh, special events. So they are willing to you know adjust their schedule just for the game. Whereas like um, casual gamers make up the majority of the the users, and they you know they would move from game to game really easily so whenever there's like a new game on Facebook and there are new games on Facebook every day um, it's a real challenge to really retain and keep these users engaged 
Um, even if you do manage to keep them in the game, uh, it's a huge challenge just trying to get them to spend um, that, that first dollar or first five dollars. And, you know, um, it's really difficult to sort of sync the hardcore users with the casual users because hardcore users, you know, like, okay, we want to be online at this time and play together, but casual users, you know, if they have something on, they're not going to change their schedule just to play the game. Um, so this is something that we've been sort of pondering, like, does it really always have to be the case where, like, okay, you have hardcore game, it's, you know, a little more difficult to get users, get them into the game, because um, the game is a little more difficult, there's a higher, um, more difficult learning curve. Um, so there's higher ARPU there. But on the other hand, we have a casual game, it's really easy to acquire users, the learning curve is very gentle. So it's easier to retain players, but it's more difficult to monetize. Does it really have to be sort of this um, a dichotomy? And I think, um, in a sense, Candy Crush is the you know example of a game that mechanically is um, possibly a, a casual game, but when you have players really you know reaching level two hundred, um, there was an article in the Hong Kong newspaper about how someone um, spent thirty six hours playing and had to be hospitalized. So I think by any measure, that is definitely a hardcore gamer playing. A casual title. So I would say it's not so much about hardcore games versus social games. Sorry, I mean casual games. But we have hardcore users and um, casual users. So, you know, developing um, casual games is great because um, it's much easier for the average user to pick up. And the ideal goal to shoot for is to make every casual game into a game that people can really become hardcore about. So, I think it's really about um, giving users um, functions and features to become hardcore users, uh, building for long-term engagement, and I've just summarized it into like three sort of general areas you can uh, implement in your games to try and make them more hardcore user-ready. Uh, so, tasks and achievements to appeal to um, the little OCD person in um, all of us. It's really effective, we found, um, having tasks, you know, um, if you have uncompleted tasks, it really helps with user retention and getting people to um, continue playing the game. Um, leveling systems does not only refer to like, okay, level one, level two, but um, a lot of ways for people to get stronger. So ways to like, you know, grind their items, um, make the items stronger, get more powerful um, items. Um, and finally, adding like a multiplayer competitive aspect to the game. And there are many levels of um, competition. So, okay. Um, what are some of the things you can do to make users become more hardcore? Uh, give them a sense of ownership. Because uh, I guess in part because we are primarily a, a Facebook game developer. So we often have to interact with our users through the, the Facebook wall and uh, it really gives them a, a sense of ownership when, you, when the developer actually bothers to give them a reply. And it's great because other users can see that, okay, the developer is active, um, the game is not going to like suddenly close down or the, it's not like they don't care about our feedback. And we find that the users that we do engage um, in this manner um, do tend to stick around and Sometimes all it takes is like, you know, someone posts a question, you answer his question, and he actually decides to buy something just to reward you for that interaction. Um, another something that is uh, great and quite often featured in um, a number of um, Chinese games is they have this uh, one week period for you to build up your city, and then after that, they open you to the um, very vicious war of PvP where people can just pillage and destroy everything you've built up over the last seven days. So that is um, something that we have as well in our games, even though not to the extent that you can destroy um, someone's entire city. Um, you know, incentivizing people to, to share what they've built up, um, screenshots with, um, to share with friends. Um, some design contests, which I'm going to just show you in a minute and um, having a story. So, you know, next week on Bell Stations or Social Life. 
but um, as the primary story writer and game designer must say that writing a story is kind of tedious, so probably want to find other ways to have story elements rather than writing a very lengthy and uh, detailed story. So for Facebook at least, um, running contests which allow players to um, you know, customize and express themselves is um, highly effective. Most of our, uh, I, th I would say the most effective page posts that we have are the contest posts because you know, um, to kind of win the contest, um, players have to get friends to, to like. And um, I think just the fact that it's an avenue for players to say like, okay, you know, I didn't build this game, you know, someone else built this game, but I get to customize my character in this game and, and show it off. That gives them uh, that sense of ownership. So back to multiplayer, we have um, different levels of multiplayer and I mean depending on the type of game that you have um, some of this uh, may be suitable or unsuitable um, on let's say the individual player level that is um, you know you don't interact with anyone at all for uh, bell stations we have a crew system where you add friends and they can like help you out with things um, send gifts help you out with um, fighting bosses um, PvP is kind of a light form of interaction because you don't really know who you're fighting, but the fact that it's another player that you're fighting and not a um, generic NPC, that does um, give the game a feel that, okay, there's, there's a lot of other people playing this game as well, so that's going to um, encourage me to continue playing the game as well. And I think for us, that top level, and this is really um, highly effective for monetization, uh, we have guilds or clans and 70% of our paying users are actually people who join these guilds and clans. So within um, the clans, I mean, there's, um, I would call it like group competition. So the, the group does a lot because they want to win as a group. So they encourage each other to buy, which is much more effective than us trying to tell users to buy. Um, it's much more effective for users to tell their friends to spend money on the game rather than us trying to get them to spend money on the game. So um, one, one, one of the strengths um, of our company is that we've, even though we have a very large um, Southeast Asian audience, which is um, known to be difficult to monetize, we have actually been pretty effective at um, you know, getting some cash out of them. So every type of gamer and People often start out as like casual gamers um, in a new game. And as they get to know more of the game, they may or may not become hardcore gamers. So compared to when we first started, uh, we have a much better understanding of like the gamer life cycle um, in the game. And basically what you want to do is to try and um, monetize them most effectively at each stage of the cycle. So for let's say, um, a new player, casual user, um, they're just building up their levels, they're just starting to get the new, uh, know the game. Um, you want to have like shortcuts available, um, easy power-ups like, okay, so this is taking a long time. Um, okay, you know, for just um, a dollar, you can skip all this hassle and jump, you know, really um, into the fun part of the game. And um, our game, we, we have a lot of like older players who are like telling the new players like, okay, uh, the really fun stuff starts at level 50, so you really need to get to level 50 quick. And that really helps to, to boost that monetization. For the gamers who have been playing, we actually do have a um, large number of users who have been playing our game for like three years or four years. Um, so these guys are really into the game, but it's so important um, for the company to, to keep these guys happy and engaged. So um, getting them into the clans is really useful because there's that constant um, player-driven content of like trying to outdo um, the other clan. So, or if let's say, um, you know, um, this other guy, um, you know, he created some drama in the forum and I want to get back at him, I get back to him, at him through the game and that ultimately benefits us. So um, beyond just like adding hardcore elements to your casual game so that you can improve monetization, engagement, 
um, you do also need to consider um, that there is some balancing work to be done because if you have hardcore gamers side by side with casual gamers, um, at often times, um, especially in competitive PvP games, like the casual player might say, okay, you know what, these um, hardcore guys, they're way too strong. I don't even want to try and um, you know, compete with these guys. So there are a number of ways to, to handle this. Um, I think especially with social games, um, the way we do it is we have different sort of ranking tables. So you start first by ranking people amongst their friends. Um, if you drop them straight into like the global ranking, the global sort of PvP arena, then there's this guy who's been playing the game for a really long time or you spend a lot of money on the game and that's really discouraging for new casual users. Um, matchmaking uh, mechanics are extremely important because um, in any game, especially for our game where uh, it's not a pure skill-based sort of game, uh, playing longer, um, having spent more time on the game, you do get stronger. So you need to have um, ways to balance how these people are going to play against um, someone who is absolutely new and he does not have those kinds of power-ups uh, without forcing the guy to, to spend money you know, before he's even had fun with the game. So um, my colleague, Tian Yang, is our CTO and he'll be speaking more about the, some of the technical considerations for um, developing hardcore social casual titles. Okay, yeah. Um, so I'll be touching uh, briefly and, uh, about how we actually uh, got the game online. Uh, because uh, for us, Battle Stations, uh, at a point of time when we did it, it was the first time that we did an online uh, game uh, with uh, multiplayer support. So it was a very uh, new uh, approach for us. So when we first started, uh, we actually uh, started this game uh, when we heard about uh, Facebook. It was uh, in September 2007, where uh, it was just uh, open to developers to uh, get their games or apps into the social network. So when we first went in, um, the game by itself was uh, rather basic uh, integration. We just uh, sort of integrated uh, login. Uh, other concerns that we had uh, at the early st uh, stages was uh, privacy because all along when you have been uh, playing uh, games, uh, social networks is something that is uh, quite new to players. You, uh, most players have been playing behind uh, a avatar, but now you'll be playing a game whereby your uh, online social profile is uh, sort of exposed. So uh, to handle this, we sort of... Uh, had to manage the privacy concerns that some of these players have, especially um, in a PvP environment uh, such as uh, battle stations where uh, players are fighting uh, against one another and things uh, such as like griefing, uh, for example, if someone uh, sunk your ship, you might want to get back at him and uh, you might want to bring it to the uh, social uh, network side of things as well. So we actually uh, still uh, implemented an avatar system for the players to sort of hide behind. And uh, this sort of uh, generated some uh, interesting uh, issues as well. So among clans, uh, some of the top clans are very competitive and uh, they would try to uh, have uh, sort of spies enter the uh, opposing clans so that they can uh, collect intelligence like uh, when the, uh, the other clans will be active, uh, when they will be sort of like uh, starting a clan war and stuff like that. With that info, then they will try to counter the other clans and stuff like that. So because of this, some of the top clans actually em enforces a very strict uh, interview process to get members into their clan. So these are so sort of some of the interesting things that we did not plan for, but sort of evolved uh, as the game um, uh, went along. Okay. And we also have some issues with player accounts. Uh, Traditionally, uh, online games uh, sort of manage their own uh, user accounts and stuff like that. With uh, social networks, you sort of uh, integrate your uh, login with the social networks. So we had uh, issues whereby, I, I guess, you can't really uh, control the uh, sign-up process. So in this case, we have to handle, like, uh, some players will be creating fake accounts so that they can, like, feed on 
the fake accounts to level up their themselves, stuff like that. We also have uh, social en uh, engineering uh, by some players, especially like uh, they will uh, create a Facebook account whereby they uh, name themselves someone of another clan, so to like add themselves as friends to other clan members in another clan, stuff like that going on. And we have also cases whereby uh, maybe some players, their account uh, uh, blocked by Facebook due to them doing uh, spamming or stuff like that, and they can't get back into the game since that's the only way they can log into the game. So these are some of the issues that as a games company, uh, using uh, Facebook login, for example, you will be faced with and you need to sort of handle. And there are also, uh, like Leonard mentioned earlier on, we have a lot of users who are working adults. Uh, so a couple of companies actually block access to Facebook. So these players would like, request for us, is there another way to log in without having to go through Facebook because they want to play our game during office hours? Yeah, so that's some of the issues that we also sort of face. And certain countries, uh, uh, in certain countries, Facebook is blocked. So for example, China. So we have players who sometimes travel there and they still want to play the game and they can't. So these are some of the issues you will have to uh, handle with, let's say you uh, uh, integrated with uh, particular social networks. Okay? And the thing with social networks is, is uh, something that's beyond your control. So you need to be uh, aware of like the changes uh, coming into the platform. So so far with uh, Facebook, we we can see a lot of changes uh, through throughout the years that we have been on the platform since 2007 to uh, today. So there's a lot been a lot of changes like um, so uh, one of the uh, changes I highlight is like the implementation of Facebook credits and when that happened. Um, uh, Games who have been relying on their own payment methods from the early days are now uh, required to use Facebook credits and only Facebook credits. If you are um, using, uh, if you are doing a Canvas app, so these are some of the stuff uh, that um, uh, developers have to be aware of and uh, manage. Okay. And usually they are out of your control because you would have to uh, do that. And uh, more recently, Facebook credits is going to be phased out. So you, again, you have another change coming that uh, developers will have to spend time to uh, change uh, for their games. Okay, so uh, beyond Facebook, we actually integrated our games into other uh, networks as well, and each network has their own issues and stuff uh, as well. So for example, uh, Chrome Web Store was one of the other networks that we have integrated with, and uh, for Chrome Web Store, it's a very bad, uh, network, there's no login, there's no payment channels, there's no friends list. So everything there is uh, up to you to integrate and uh, create. Then, like for example, Friendster, I understand uh, that they went through an uh, acquisition period. So there was this period where they had a lot of changes to their platform. They renamed their domain name. They uh, decided to go back to the Friendster name again, stuff like that, and MySpace. I guess you guys know how it was revamped. We even uh, did a version for uh, Southeast Asia version of uh, MSM Messenger, but as you know, Messenger's service is closing. So uh, we did all these uh, things in order to try to expand our user base as well. And for the bottom, uh, the second row of uh, platforms, those are uh, Taiwanese uh, portals. Uh, that's because we actually realized a large number of our user base came from Taiwan. So we actually even explored like, uh, integrating to game portals specifically in Taiwan. And now I just touch a bit on the how, how we handle the server load uh, for our games when we first launched. When we first launched our game in 2007, the team was very new to server stuff and we basically had very little or no knowledge about these things. And at that point in time, we actually uh, uh, knew about cloud computing uh, starting up, but at that point in time, things were still very unstable and the pricing was actually quite uh, a bit more expensive. Uh, for example, I think like AWS, since they first started in 2006 until today, they have reduced their pricing more than 30 times. So like uh, back in those days, it was still not very viable for us, but I think nowadays things are a bit more different. Uh, so during those days, we actually had to do a lot of things ourselves. We were learning new stuff with technologies uh, related to the server side stuff, and we had hardcore players, or some players actually wrote like uh, script button clickers to play our game because they were trying to be more competitive than the other players. Yeah, so then it's caused uh, our server load to be uh, sort of like spikes and there's lags to the other players. So we actually spent quite a bit of time trying to improve uh, performance as well. And 
we also explore like CDN since we have a lot of uh, assets uh, that are online. Uh, so like uh, this kind of uh, browser-based games is uh, different compared to like a single download games that uh, you have for like PC games. Okay. So we uh, did a lot of optimization like for our database, we create a replication to have a master-slave uh, databases so that we offload some of the reads for our database uh, from our writing uh, database. We uh, keep on tweaking our web server so that we can minimize lags and obviously we also improve our servers uh, stuff. Okay, and I'll just move on to uh, payment uh, methods and things that have changed when we first implemented our game back in uh, 2007. Uh, when Facebook first started uh, open up the, opening up the platform in 2007, there was no uh, payment methods, no Facebook credits. So, um, and in that point in time, uh, a lot of uh, developers were testing water. So, uh, obviously the easiest way to monetize is through advertising. And that was what every other app was doing during that period. However, you can see advertising dollars dropping the moment more and more ever, uh, developers get on to the bandwagon. So uh, that's something that we observe, and eventually from 08 onwards, uh, you can see the number of uh, apps or games with advertising uh, uh, becoming less, or a lot of the apps actually completely remove ads altogether. And we also saw the trend of offers, like uh, getting users to do surveys to earn coins and stuff like that. Uh, the interesting thing to note is uh, you actually see this trend repeated itself on a mobile space as well. So in the early days of a mobile platform, you will see uh, mobile advertising as the uh, form of uh, engagement uh, for monetization. And then nowadays you have uh, uh, surveys and offers, and surveys and offers are here to stay. Uh, so they are still uh, around, and it's now uh, sort of officially supported uh, by Facebook, and we are still using that as well. The revenue is not that great because it's very dependent on region. So if there are no survey companies in your region that's offering such offers, you probably would not get anything out of it. And in the Southeast Asia region, we realize that this is uh, quite, quite bad for offers because there's not that many spending in this case. Uh, majority is uh, uh, mainly in the US side. Okay. And finally, uh, we see the in-app purchasing phase uh, becoming more popular from uh, 09 onwards, and it has been the mainstay now. Um, we, it sort of prompted us to remove ads from our game in uh, Facebook as well when we had a day whereby just having someone spend in in-app purchasing uh, is equal to the, uh, or rather more than the amount you earn from the ads for that whole day. Yeah. Uh, the reason being, uh, in our case, uh, for hardcore games, you actually have less impressions because your market is very niche. So the, the, the amount of money that you get from uh, ads impression is not that fantastic. So Actually, for uh, hardcore games, you probably go more for in-app purchases rather than advertising, unless for some reason your game has a very large user base. But even then, uh, ads tend to put off some users, and it's generally better to just focus on in-app purchasing if you have all the uh, payment channels uh, and uh, monetization strategy already in place. However, with in-app purchasing, you will need to be able to handle fraud cases, chargeback cases, and um, I think uh, online there have been uh, some uh, other developers who talk about how they uh, face with at least 15% of their revenue uh, uh, gets uh, converted uh, due to uh, chargeback cases. So what we realize is for developers to uh, combat chargeback cases, you have to take action fast and hard against players who uh, make use of this uh, chargeback, like using uh, stolen credit cards and stuff like that. Uh, once you take action fast, they will know that uh, this game is not a good way to use uh, such uh, uh, stolen credit cards, for example, and stuff like that, and the, the thing will not spread. The moment you ignore this, they will start telling their friends and other players, and the, the thing will just get out of hand. Okay. And obviously, with in-app purchases, uh, game balance will be an issue, as you still need a large user base. Otherwise, if all your players, uh, basically players are paying to have an advantage over the players who don't pay, so you have to maintain this uh, balance in the game as well. And we eventually uh, started localizing our game since, as I mentioned earlier, we have a large number of uh, Chinese users. So we had uh, uh, also first time doing localization for our games. So we had issues uh, with uh, trying to convert our database from Latin character support to UTF-8 and stuff like that. Um, we have some issues whereby if you have, uh, for example, Chinese users creating clans in Chinese name, 
the English players have no idea how to pronounce the opponent clan. Yeah, and so these are some of the issues that you face with, and we eventually split up the servers into uh, separate servers so that these users uh, do not uh, mix together. And having good translation is also not easy, so these are some of the issues that we face with, especially with UI. Uh, like Chinese text tends to require a, a bigger height, otherwise the text will become too small to read. Okay. Yeah. And so I'm done. So we have Thank you very questions. much. So in the interest of time, we don't, have, uh, we don't have time for questions on this particular session, but I'm sure these guys will be available after this session if you wanted to approach them directly.